everyone. My name is Hunter Hinson, and I'm a student facilitator here at the Oxford Internet Policy and Politics Hybrid Conference. Very excited to welcome our two guest speakers today who are coming to discuss the different topics regarding regulation with tech. So we'll begin first with Professor Dwayne Winsek, and then secondly begin with Professor Keldon Bester, who we're both super grateful to have today. Uh, zooming in from different parts across the world. Um, so I believe, Professor Winsack, you'll be going first, and we welcome you to begin your lecture. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mauricio, for having us. Uh, Kelton and I are both very happy to be here today. We'd also like to thank uh, Daniel and his colleagues for organizing this conference and for inviting us. I hope everything's been off to a good start. So uh, here's what we plan to do uh, in the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, we want to take a look at the wave of regulation that's taking place around the world as country after country struggles with how to deal with the rise of a much more centralized internet that's ruled by a few dominant search engines, social media services, and digital content aggregation platforms. What are the options on the table? Our argument is basically this that too often policymakers are leaning into media policy and broadcasting regulation to inform how they want to approach a new generation of internet services regulation. What we want to suggest is that there's a second route, and one that we prefer, that turns to the history of communications regulation and antitrust as the inspiration for more democratic internet regulation. We want to show this as a path is an alternative and at least complementary response to the nexus of concerns about communication and power and democracy that we share. Since the 19 or since the 2010s, there's been this real spin around in terms of how people think about uh, internet regulation. Really since that time, there's been this mounting wave of concern around the world about the, in the increasing centralization of the internet, problems with content moderation, uh, and how to properly approach the internet from a point of view of a more interventionist approach to regulation after the two and a half decades of a relatively hands-off and kind of loosey-goosey multi-stakeholder model of internet governance. When they do this, they're looking to models to inspire and inform what should be done. And too often in our view is that they look to analogies to media policy and broadcasting regulation and its concerns uh, and goals uh, with things like media effects, uh, opinion power, content regulation, the public interest, and how to reconcile uh, powerful forms of media with democracy. Our, our view, and the one we pre uh, prefer, is to look to the revival of the anti-monopoly movement for instructions and its roots uh, and inspiration in the parallel evolution that took place of the modern industrial communications uh, and media systems from the mid 19th century on and the simultaneous rise at that time of antitrust law and sector specific communications uh, regulation. I think it's really important for us to understand that this powerful relationship and the imbalanced relationship between big tech and telecoms on the one side and the media industries on the other is not new. Since the mid 19th century, the media industries, the press, news wire services, broadcasting, film and computing have all grown up in very close proximity to the big tech companies and telecom operators. Regulators have always intervened to prevent the media industries from becoming completely dominated by these much larger uh, big telecom and telecom uh, or uh, big tech and telecom operators uh, in their wings and upon whom the fate of the media was so dependent. Today we hear there's a lot of talk that tends to conflate the cultural industries with the big tech or IT uh, sector and the idea that we can get uh, uh, a new approach to online content moderation, and this might be a worthwhile thing uh, to have, but it ignores this longstanding historical relationship between, as I keep saying, big tech on the one side and the media and cultural industries on the other, and how we can approach that 
based on the lessons from antitrust law and communications uh, regulation. We're suggesting that this is a major pathway uh, that should be informing uh, internet services regulation now. And in some ways we can see this, for example, in the European Union's Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act. Here's a nice illustration from one of the kind of popular culture icons of the mid 20th century that reminds us of the very close relationship in North America and the United States in particular between the biggest telecommunications company in the world at the time, AT&T and television. And here's AT&T touting its intervention from the very beginning in the development and deployment of a radically new technology of television, a medium, I should say, of television that came to dominate the second half of the 20th century. And when we look at this historical intertwined relationship between big tech and the media, we can see that the state has intervened through a series of cross communications and media ownership uh, uh, consolidation breakup uh, measures to try to structure these relationships in ways that were more consistent with creating more open, competitive and pluralistic uh, markets and reconciling both communications operators and the media with the public uh, interest. Here's just a really quick list. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but just to give you a sense of the span of time uh, across which we see regulators intervening, at least in the North American context. And there's examples of this in the European context, each with their own characteristics. But really right off the uh, bat with the development of the modern industrial communication system, we see the application of common carriage to structure the relationship between telegraph and telephone operators on the one side and the press, news wire services, and messenger services that were fundamentally dependent upon uh, distributing their services and accessing customers and audiences across the wires owned by the telegraph and telecoms companies. Fast forward to the early 1910s, and five years after AT&T had bought over West, bought Western Union, the Department of Justice in the United States leans in and forces AT&T to divest itself of Western Union. Fast forward a decade and a half after that, AT&T is deeply involved in radio broadcasting, has grandiose plans for the American broadcasting system. The regulators start to raise their eyes. Corporate agreements are made to divvy up the field. AT&T back, backs out of broadcasting. Film industry, something similar. Two big tech groups, the telecom group, the radio group, vying for control of the introduction and rollout of sound in the film industry. And they get deeply involved, including in commissioning and editing and vetting film scripts. But by the end of the 1930s, an emboldened uh, FCC leans in, raises its eyebrows, seeing the writing on the wall, AT&T backs out. We see this as well when computing comes on, the FCC leans in with the series of uh, inquiries over the course of uh, 30 uh, years, which basically draw lines between the telecom, dominant telecoms operators like AT&T, an emerging area of computing and information services and requires split offs or Chinese walls to be drawn between these two areas. Uh, this carries through to the end of the uh, decade uh, with, or to the end of the 1990s with the development of the Telecommunications Act, uh, which lifts the restrictions that allow these sectors to come together in what is hoped to be kind of a great free for all, a great digital free for all across all the media sectors. But once we kind of step back and we look at this history and we ask ourselves, you know, what are the main principles and forms of government intervention, legal regulatory intervention that we can draw from this? Well, here's a small list of them. Control over monopoly and gatekeeping powers. This is exactly what we're talking about today with respect to uh, dominant platforms. Uh, second, interconnection and interoperability. We need to remember the way in which this history of telecommunications and the relationship to the media is based on building out federation of networks and technologies to build up the modern communication system. And now we need to apply those lessons to our own times. 
We have common carriage, the breaking up of the control of carriers over content, the breaking up the relationship between the medium and the message. The basic rule, if you control the pipes, you can't control the messages of the speakers who are using and relying on those pipes. Affordable universal service, strong privacy and data protection rights, and also concerns with freedom of expression. All of these are normative values showing us that this background era of antitrust law and communications regulation were normative, were engaged with the normative issues of their time. They were not just narrow economistic or technical uh, measures. I want to hand it over to Keldon now. He'll take it away for the next couple of minutes. Thanks so much, Dwayne. So, you know, in the process of creating eras, 1850 to 19, or 1890 to 1950, really is the high tide of this progressive era and age of social reform in, U in the U.S. and Europe, respectively, where we see this democratic anti-monopoly tradition, as well as this, you know, strong focus on communications regulation, really at its height. But, you know, the important thing to remember is that these ideas are always consist, uh, um, contested, even when they appear to have a hegemony in the direction of policy. So in the same period where the democratic anti-monopoly tradition is at its height, we have you know, these, a laissez-faire argument for you know, the preservation of the free press and the free market and, and advocacy for a hands-off approach to allow these um, uh, markets to develop naturally as well as this more technocratic um, idea that you know, industrialization and innovation are things that need to be promoted, but they also can be balanced by this technocratic hand in the, in the, in, in the service of public interest concerns. So all that to say is, as Duane runs through, we have this peak of the anti-monopoly era, but, but in the background over this period, these you know, contesting viewpoints are present. Uh, next slide, Dwayne, Dwayne thanks. And, and it's after the 1950s and really accelerating in the 70s that we see those um, twin viewpoints, um, sorry, Dwayne, I just keep on that slide there, um, come forward and, uh, no, sorry, uh, slide nine, <laughs> thanks, sure. um, come forward and eventually overtake this democratic monopoly agenda. So what do these two forces, both the laissez-faire and the technocratic approach have in common? Well, what, what it ends up playing is that a rollback of the state and an expansion of the scope and markets for a, a new order that is much more focused on this defense of big business and assuming that monopoly is the logical endpoint of a maturing capitalism, you know, how do we make the, the most of this? Uh, next slide, please, Dwayne. Now, to, to overgeneralize, I think we can split this arc into two big periods, you know, 1960 to 2000, really the rise and dominance of the globalization, you know, neoliberal technocratic model. We do have the breakup of AT&T, as Dwayne mentioned, but things like the Telecommunications Act of 1996 in the U.S. and its export to the rest of the world um, are representative of this uh, pullback and uh, pullback of the anti-monopoly way of thinking and a bringing forward of the role of markets and regulation based more on the technical standard versus the public interest concerns that we have detailed before. And what this then transitions into is, you know, 2000 to 2010, you know, this market liberalization uh, arc is really complete um, and, and now coincides with the rise of the commercial internet. So we have you know, the emergence of the multi-stakeholder governance models for the internet, as opposed to the stronger role for uh, government actors. And, and we have two stories going on. On the one hand, we have new markets emerging, you know, search, social, e-commerce, um, you know, very promising challenges to entrenched power. But in sort of more traditional media and communication markets, we have, you know, waves of consolidation, diagonal, vertical, horizontal. You know, we have the recreation of Bell after the breakup of AT&T. And, and that process going on in the background, I think, foreshadows you know, what we see today in the, in the more modern era. Next slide, please, Dwayne. And, and so what are we seeing, even in these more promising markets that, that have recently emerged? You know, the, the promise of this free and open internet has really been replaced by a handful of operators that are quite dominant in their respective spaces. 
Here we highlight online search, social advertising, aggregation and distribution of content. Not only are these concentration levels high, they, as the years go on, they appear to be quite stable. And in the case of areas like search, you know, they really are um, higher than we, we've seen even in the era of regulated monopoly. Um, and, and as we get go on, that, that, that concentration and the power that's associated with it is increasingly flexed um, in the markets in which these players are, pres are present. We see things, unilateral terms of content moderation and cultural production, lowest common denominator privacy standards, and you know, a, a topic very pre prominent today is you know, this role of gatekeeper fees, thinking of app stores, e-commerce, you know, exciting new companies and new methods of distribution that are now being, um, from which, you know, rents are now being extracted. Sorry, Dwayne, next slide. Thanks. But 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 in response to this, and, and really beginning in 2010 and 2011, you start to see the resurgence of this uh, long dormant antitrust tradition that we've been talking about. You know, that both the European Commission and the FTC open cases against Google we have, of course, the trilogy of EC cases, shopping, mobile search, and advertising. And then in the you know, late 2010s, we have a veritable flood of study, inquiry, and reform um, into the questions of competition in, in big tech. And this is not just limited to the Anglosphere, um, but, but quite wide, widely spread across the world. Next slide, please, Duane. But as these uh, antitrust enforcement actions gain traction, we also see a parallel rise of concerns of you know, disinformation, fake news, content moderation. And, and these concerns um, end up really dominating the conversation from a policy lens um, for, 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 quite a, for quite a broad number of the countries we've just discussed where this you know, nascent antitrust energy is building. And, and alongside that, we have the notion that Broadcasting and the history of broadcasting regulation is actually a better guide for the regulation of these digital platforms. Again, with, as Duane has mentioned, the supposed monopoly on normative rather than purely economic values, which the democratic anti-monopoly tradition, you know, we go back to Bork, but he certainly wasn't alone, um, have been really narrowed to, um, uh, to this consumer welfare lens to, to, to bucket a series of terms. But so this, this, this predominance of the broadcasting approach, and we've, we've listed some examples below, thinking about Canada, where we're coming from, the online, safe, uh, the online streaming act, the online news act, you know, cons consultations about online harms, the, the, the conversation really has been focused uh, on this you know, broadcasting approach to regulation. All right. So I'm gonna uh, close out uh our session here this morning with a couple of more uh, points, the kind of a pitch, if you will, for why communications regulation and antitrust is the better uh, path forward instead of this excessive uh, focus on uh, content and content regulation drawn, it drawing its inspiration from the history of broadcasting and media policy. So for one, uh, I think we have a much deeper history uh, when we look to the history of antitrust uh, law and telecommunications regulation. Instead of in, starting in the 1920s and 1930s, we see this emerging kind of in fits and starts in the 1860s, 1870s, but really gaining traction kind of by the 1890s and in the first couple of decades uh, into the 20th uh, century. And I think that longer history opens us up to a wider kind of picture of how modern communications fit uh, within contemporary societies that's much, much broader uh, than the broadcasting and media policy uh, lens. And by this, I'm saying that it gives us this much more uh, holistic and integrated political economic view of communications culture and capitalism, whereas the alternative focuses very narrowly on the top of the stack so to speak, just on the content uh, questions, really, as opposed to reaching across uh, the stack and treating uh, each of them uh, in proportion to the other. I think there's a much stronger and more varied uh, regulatory toolbox that's better uh, suited to addressing market and gatekeeping power in relationship to the very complex social, technical, and infrastructural systems 
that underlay digital platforms, the internet, and increasing swaths of our society from the financial system uh, to markets and to the, you know, all the nooks and crannies of our everyday lives that are really dependent upon having access to internet services. And finally, this idea that somehow we need to look to media policy and broadcasting in order to kind of disinter the normative values uh, that they offer. And it is indeed a rich uh, uh, treasure trove of normative values that one can find there. But the idea that they have a monopoly on normative values, I think, is completely uh, misguided. And we have at least as deep and rich and varied a normative treasure trove within the history of antitrust law and telecommunications uh, regulation. I pointed to some of that earlier. Universal and for affordable service, data and privacy protection. Uh, freedom of expression values that deal head on with questions about a clash between large platform or network operators claims to speech and those of users claims to speech. And what the common carriage tradition tells us is that it is individuals and the users of networks claims to freedom of expression that trump those of corporate claims to freedom of expression. So they deal head on with questions of power in no way can be seen or properly cast as being narrowly technocratic and economistic, although sometimes the jargon, of course, uh, suggests otherwise. Lastly, I think this new digital platform regulatory uh, toolbox drawing on comms regulation uh, and antitrust law can really focus on some of the biggest players. And we see a really good model, I think, emerging uh, within Europe around the DSA and the, the DMA in its gradated levels of regulation that apply to different groups of platforms depending upon their scale, scope, and influence. So basically, the bigger you are, the tougher the rules. What a great guideline. Second, we really need to focus on how that history of communications regulation in particular, really the baseline for that was really tough information disclosure obligations that were absolutely essential to regulators effectively knowing the domain in which they were to claim expertise and they were to regulate. We see that emerging in the DSA, the DMA, and to their credit in Canada, both the Online Streaming Act and Online News Act have uh, information disclosure obligation provisions in them, whether or not they're going to be tough enough and up to the job, that's really going to depend on how the regulator rules them out in the next five to 10 years. One of the things that I find really attractive and Keldon does here as well, I think is the strong focus in antitrust law and communications regulation in particular is on uh, the structural focus, the idea of breakups and spinoffs and structural regulation basically structural rules of the game, ex ante uh, rules of the game that basically recognize when you have certain industrial forms and market structures, you're more likely to get certain kinds of outcomes. And we need to basically nip problems in the bud by preventing excessive consolidation or cross industry consolidation uh, in the bud by using these kinds of measures, structural separation, common carriage, spinoffs, breakups. This comprehensive regulatory toolkit for internet and digital platform regulation really should include all of the above. And then in the last instance, reach to media policy and broadcasting to fill in the remaining concerns regarding content moderation, disinformation, and fake news. That's our presentation for today. Thank you very much uh, for being here, and we look forward to uh, talking with you further about this and addressing any questions that you might have. Thank you guys so much for that lecture. Um, so we'll move to questions. If anyone in the room has any questions for our speakers, please feel free to raise your hand. Or any online. Um, seeing that I'll ask a question maybe to start us off. Uh, I was interesting, you know, there's a lot of discussion with antitrust about the need for governments to step in and break up certain companies. And I wonder how this squares with the fact that governments often benefit from some of these companies at times. So if we look at, you know, the book Cloud Empires, which discusses how different tech platforms came to rise 
and how basically users on those platforms kind of invited the authority in. Um, it's interesting to see how governments have kind of given these companies a lot of roles in terms of content moderation. <laughs> there you go. Um, in terms of content moderation, in terms of managing the public sphere, in terms of the problem of exchange and trade online, you know, governments have granted these companies a lot of power to regulate these areas themselves. And it kind of gives governments, especially like the US, the ability to kind of stand away and not have the need to regulate it themselves. So I'm curious, you know, we see a lot of lawmakers on Capitol Hill saying we want to regulate big tech, but they never actually do. So I'm curious, do you think we need to create incentives for states to regulate and break up these companies? Or, you know, how do we define and look at this kind of tension here where it might be a benefit for, you know, countries to not want to have these companies disappear or that they're too big to fail? So uh, I have a few uh, observations on that and then I'll turn it over to Kelton. Does that sound okay there? So I think you're absolutely uh, right, uh, Mauricio. I mean, uh, politicians rely very much on meta uh, as central parts of their uh, communication campaigns in electoral uh, uh, settings, uh, as well as to maintain ongoing communications with their uh, ridings and constituents and so on. And so they themselves are, are highly uh, dependent uh, upon these entities. And here in Canada, uh, the uh, move or attempts to push forward strong privacy and data protection laws have really been uh, held back uh, by the fact that the ones that are most reluctant to embrace such measures are the political parties themselves who are always seeking a carve out or watered down versions of this. And then I think the last bit that I hear you saying here is, you know, this idea of, you know, it's it makes it a lot easier when there's a few small or big players uh, to do the really tough and sometimes dirty work of content moderation. And this is really the idea of delegating state regulatory authority to pl private platforms. And wouldn't the state uh, be biased to having fewer uh, dogs on leashes than more? Um, and I think the answer is, yeah, of course. And this is exactly what I think we are seeing uh, today that looks, you know, I see I, I see this in the form uh, that you're suggesting. And I think we see it in Canada here with respect to how the politics around the Online News Act played out. And I think you saw Meta and Google kind of take striking two different poses. Meta was just flat out, no, we're not going to accept this new uh, online news act. We're not going to play ball. We're going to pick up our ball and go home. I think what we saw with Google was uh, much more interesting. And it seemed to me that Google was trying to step into the shoes of the old regulated AT&T. As in, you know what? We'll accept uh, this regulation because regulation accepts bigness and not only accepts bigness, but as Kelvin was saying earlier, uses this technocratic kind of set of ideas to say that we will turn bigness to public goods. We will harness bigness to achieving public interest. And here, if it is in a better regime for the distribution and sharing of news, fine. So I'll stop there and Kelvin. Yeah, you know, I think it's... Um what I've often called the hangover from that, you know, 19th, you know, to, to put it a little over generally, but, you know, what starts in the 60s and really reaches its peak in 2000 uh, is that retreat of um, the state and the assumption that um, the markets and the main players in those markets will handle these issues themselves. And so I, I agree with the, um, you know, there's a number of ways to do it. I think states do benefit from having, you know, their champions, so to speak. But what we're seeing, I think, post 2010 and certainly true today is um, we are having to rediscover those tools and those approaches that we discuss when the problems begin to outweigh those benefits. And the the bargain, so to speak, um, is 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 no longer you know satisfying to to societies that, that, that we traded off earlier. And, you know, as Dwayne said, this, this Online News Act, you know, in Canada, like in the U.S., we have a real hollowing out of our 
primarily advertising based um, news industry, which is certainly not only the fault or the responsibility of major platforms, but we now find ourselves in a situation where the attempts to restrike that balance um, can really be frustrated by that really one or two uh, companies. So I agree. I think the deal for decades was that this reduced approach would leave more room for markets to take care of themselves. But by abandoning that democratic anti-monopoly commitment to you know, a, a, a fair set of rules, we now find ourselves with a, with a much more difficult problem that, that we as societies faced in the past as to reclaiming a bit of that sovereignty when there are problems that that, that was, those markets really aren't addressing. All right. Thank you. Fascinating. Um, well, that concludes our time as we're now reaching 3.20 p.m., at least in British time. Um, I know it must be earlier in Canada. Um, but thank you guys again for visiting. We really appreciate your time. And thanks for a fascinating lecture. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you, Marisha. Have a good rest of your day.